Christ's mercy and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, today's message is based off of the epistle lesson, and I read again James 4, verse 6. But it gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Boy, does James ever blast his readers in today's lesson and us. In fact, we find some of the harshest words in the New Testament in our reading from James. After all, to be called earthly, unspiritual, demonic is certainly not the life that we have been called to as God's saints. Yet, James cites the evidence. There is bitter jealousy and strife, disorder and foul deeds, quarrels and fights and covetousness. I'd love to say that isn't it great that as Christians we overcame all of those problems in the first century. But that would be a lie. We see it in the world today, all over the place, don't we? And startlingly, in our congregations, in our families, on our blogs, and perhaps most troubling, in our hearts. That is why it is so shocking, but true, that James addresses this letter not to all of those sinners out there, but he's talking about us, about the church. Our sin nature continues to cling to us and respond to Satan's promptings. You can see it in how people respond to refugees, how they respond to people with, uh, from different political parties, how they respond to people with different skin colors or people from different social or economic backgrounds. Too. You can even see it in how people respond when they're driving their cars. If we boil it all down to one thought, it amounts to this. I'm number one. Me first. This is the temptation that Adam and Eve fell for in the garden, is it not? And as a human race, we've been falling for it ever since. The question about refugees, no matter how you phrase it, always boils down to this. How will this impact me? What about me? The question in politics is always, what about me? How does this impact me? Even when you're driving the car, the question is always, how are the other drivers impacting me? Don't they know that I own the road? Don't they know that I don't have to stop for red lights? Don't they know that I don't have to obey the speed limit? Don't they know that when I'm on the road, they just should pull over and let me fly? It's all about Honest evaluation of our shortcomings, though, even when it comes to driving, is not exactly one of humanity's strong suits, is it? So God helps us with the Ten Commandments, which we just read, didn't we? And yet we are so bad at honestly evaluating our shortcomings that we are even able to twist the Ten, ten, ten Commandments and evade them very easily. In fact, if you're in the church, you perhaps become quite expert at it. So we're going to review those Ten Commandments again to kind of get the sting of James, if you will. And I'm going to use a list of questions inspired by the Ten Commandments as Luther explained them in his catechism. And I found them in this book. It's called Treasury of Daily Prayer. For the first commandment, we can ask ourselves, in what or whom do I trust most for financial security, physical safety, or emotional support? 
Do I fear God's wrath and therefore avoid every sin? Is my love of God evident in my daily life? Do I expect only good from God in every situation, or do I worry and doubt and complain and feel unfairly treated when things go wrong? For the second commandment, we can ask ourselves, does the gospel adorn my daily speech and conduct, or do I curse, speak carelessly, or misuse God's name? Am I diligent and sincere in my prayers? Or have I been lazy, bored, or distracted? Do I trust that the Lord will answer my prayers according to his good and gracious will? For the third commandment, we can ask ourselves, do I despise the word by neglecting or by paying little or no attention where it is read and preached? Am I faithful in attending worship services? Or do I go sporadically, preferring to be elsewhere, almost anywhere else, than the church when it's gathered in worship? Do I pray for my pastor and support his effort to guard Christ's flock from error? With the fourth commandment, we could ask ourselves, do I submit to those whom God has put in authority over me? Have I been ashamed of, angry, stubborn, or disrespectful towards my parents, teachers, employer, pastor, government, or other authorities? Do I obey all the laws of the city, state, and county and pay my rightful share of taxes? For the fifth commandment, we could ask ourselves, have I unjustly taken the life of anyone, born or unborn? Do I hate anyone, or am I angry with anyone? Do I hold grudges? or harbor resentment? Am I abusive in word or deed towards my spouse, children, elderly parent, or anyone else? Have I ignored the plight of the helpless or been callous towards those in genuine need? For the sixth commandment, we might ask ourselves, have I held in highest regard God's gift of sexuality Or have I debased it in any way by my thoughts, words, or conduct? Am I guilty of lust or indecency or pornography? Have I reserved my sexual activity for the pleasure and consolation of my spouse and when God wills the procreation of children? For the seventh commandment, we could ask ourselves, have I gotten anything in a dishonest way? Have I made illegal copies of any printed material, audio or videotape, or computer program? Do I faithfully attend to the responsibilities of my vocation? Do I take care of what I have, pay what I owe, return what I borrow, and respect other people's property? Do I give generously, or am I selfish, stingy, and greedy with my time and money. For the Eighth Commandment, we could ask ourselves, do I speak the truth in love, or do I lie in any way? Do I gossip or take pleasure in talking about the faults and mistakes of others? Do I uphold and defend the name and reputation of others? Have I judged others when it's really not my vocation to do so, and I don't have the authority to do so? Have I gladly and willingly found ways to explain things in the best possible way, the words and actions of those who have hurt me? Am I the first to admit my own mistakes, or do I cover up my sins to try to make myself look better? For the ninth commandment, we could ask ourselves, do I have strong wants or desires or cravings that consume my thoughts? Do I resent or envy those who have more than me? Do I neglect my marriage, family, church, and other relationships in a desperate attempt to satisfy desires of the flesh? Have my wants kept me from being happy with the 
and thankful for the things that God has given me. For the tenth commandment, we could ask ourselves, am I discontent with the spouse the Lord has given me? Am I discontent with the job or the employees the Lord has given me? Have I neglected to urge someone to stay and do their duty? Have I wanted my neighbor's husband or wife, boyfriend or girlfriend, workers or property to be mine? Now, I really haven't given you enough time to ponder these questions, have I? Don't worry, I'll post them on the blog later th today. But, after an honest thought about on these things, I'm sure that you would all agree with me when I say that you would walk away saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And that is the point that James is trying to make. He wants us to recognize that we are sinners, and he wants us to come to repentance. He gives us this good, hard look at us using these really, you know, terrible, hard words so that we will say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He wants us to recognize our sinfulness and repent of it. We are then what James would call humble, having been humbled by the law of God. And so James says, but he gives more grace to cover all our sins. All of them, not just some, not just most, but he gives more grace to cover those sins. Therefore, God says, God opposes the proud. Why? Because the proud will not say, God be merciful to me, a sinner. God will say, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. But pride will never let you say, I'm a sinner. Okay? I can see it in you, and I can't see it in myself. That's pride. And that's why God is opposed to the proud but he gives grace, forgiveness, love, mercy to the humble who says, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Here is the gospel then for today's lesson. Tied up in those words, grace and humble. God is merciful to those who repent and trust in him. He is always more willing to forgive than we are to ask. James addresses this letter back in chapter 1 to those who hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is to say, to those who believe in Jesus, that he is the only begotten Son of God who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, becoming a man in like nature like us, except that, of course, no sin in him. He suffered, died, and rose on the third day and ascended back to his position of glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit from where he will return on the last day to judge all of humanity. As we honestly consider our lives in light of the Ten Commandments, we can't help but realize that we fall short of God's expectation for us. But when we consider what Jesus has done, we also can't help but realize that God's mercy, God's grace, God's love, God's forgiveness in Christ Jesus is greater than our sins. All our missteps, all our deliberate deviations. God is merciful to the repentant sinner, the humble sinner. God is forgiving. So when our reading ends with the words that it does, we can hear them for what James is telling us. He says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. That is, with a humble heart, a repentant heart, a heart that has faith in Jesus. Resist the devil in that faith, not in your own might. How did Eve do when she tried to battle the devil on her own? Not well, yeah. 
Resist the devil in faith, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. How do you draw near to God? Do you climb the top of Mount Everest and say, oh, well, this is about as high as I can get up here. Maybe I'll find God. Do you get in a 747 and fly around in the sky saying, I got really high. I can maybe find God. I'm going to get in a rocket, and I'm going to blast off to the moon, circle the moon. I'm going to send out a spacecraft, and we'll take pictures of Mars or Venus or even Pluto, and maybe we'll find God hanging out there. No. We draw near to God in faith. So when he says, you know, draw near to God, he's talking about faith in Christ, and God will draw near to you. How does he do that? In Christ, by grace, through faith in him. So, by God's grace, James is telling us, we are no longer trapped in sin. We humble ourselves in repentant faith, receiving God's forgiveness, and know that he has granted us his savior, favor. We now can, by God's grace, resist the devil. Now we can, by God's grace, find that we purify ourselves because Christ, is, who is pure, has become our head. And so on. What wonderful things God does for the humble, for those who can say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. For God grants them grace upon grace, forgiveness and mercy. So let me just say this one more time. A humble, repentant heart that trusts in Jesus for forgiveness receives God's favor. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time, I believe we received